Um, I'm going to go through this. Um, Italian and Gothic in Charleston kind of happen simultaneously, so I, I'm going to go through basically and talk about some elements of each one, each style of architecture first, the Gothic and Italianate, and then talk about some of the architects that influenced um, and actually built the buildings, the major Gothic and, and Italianate buildings in Charleston, and then talk about Charleston Village. And then when we walk around, we'll look at the buildings and you can see how those elements kind of apply to these more residential um, uh, buildings in Charleston Village. Um, just an overview quickly of, of what the slides are about. Uh, classicism by the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, classicism is kind of falling out of popularity. Um, even with fashion, clothing, architecture, when something changes, uh, it's kind of like a fad that follows. Uh, the buildings be began to be taller. Um, it's harder to apply classical orders, the three orders to taller buildings. Uh, for example, the Mills House Hotel, when it was first built, um, I believe it was five stories, and when it was rebuilt, two more stories added on to it. The Browning and Lehman uh, store down where the Riviera Theater is today, that was torn down in 1936, I believe, to build the Riviera Theater. It was a larger, about four or five story uh, building built to kind of like a mall. You walked in and it was open all the way up with an atrium. Um, it was done in the Italianate order. And then classical, I'm sorry, Catholic and Episcopal churches were remodeled in the Gothic style in Charleston. Um, a prime example, the Unitarian Church down the street. Um, I have some slides of that, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, the Gothic and Italianate extended from Roman architecture, even the Gothic. First they were building Roman cathedrals, then the Gothic uh, kind of came into play. Jones and Lee, two architects in Charleston, were kind of the city picks for the city of Charleston back in the 1840s and 50s. Um, as today, so your Charleston has their favorite architects in town. Um, they did too back in the 1840s. The Italianate resembles Roman apartment blocks and palazzos. I have a couple of slides. Sorry, blind here. Um, I have a couple of slides that the Orphan House, for example, is reminiscent of an Italian palazzo in Rome and Florence. Um, the Gothic Revival is a part of the ecclesiological movement, which I will get into. I'll read, read kind of a short little quote in this book that explains it perfectly. I, I really can't explain it any better than that, so um, I'll explain that. Basically, the Protestant churches in town were, were um, for example, the Unitarian Church. That remodel is a direct uh, result of the ecclesiological movement that started in New York. Um, Roman used for more military purposes. You'll see slides of the German artillery building that used to be on Wentworth Street where the Eco Fitness building is now parking deck. Um, the Citadel, the old Citadel at Marion Square is an example of that. And then you have the eclectic and romantic periods or styles within the Italianate and Gothic. And that's more like the Moorish buildings or like the Farmers and Exchange Bank over on East Bay Street. And the Carpenter Gothic, which we have two houses on tour, over one on Franklin and one on Queen Street that have uh, Carpenter Gothic details. Finally, I'll talk about the history of Charleston Village and how it developed. Um, but first, Architecture firms in Charleston began during this period, 1840s through the 1860s. I'll talk a lot about Edward C. Jones and Francis D. Lee. Um, but across the nation, there are two major developments, the creation of the firms and then how those firms could work together on different styles of architecture. So up until about 1820, the Greek Revival, you have classical architecture basically, it's the colonial period, with the classical orders. Around 1840 you begin to see the Italianate, the Gothic, the um, 
second empire in America, which these started about 50 to 100 years earlier in England. Um, other architects, Latrobe and Mills, were more neoclassical. Robert Mills, a South Carolina native, uh, then moves up north, does more neoclassical architecture. Again, Jones and Lee in Charleston. Jones teaches Lee. He's only about four or five years younger, Lee is, than Jones. Um, Italianate and Gothic. They kind of switch off, they combine. Um, Jones does more Italianate. Francis D. Lee does more Gothic. Um, Ithiel Town and Alexander Jackson Davis, they form the firm Town and Davis. In North Carolina, they do the North Carolina State Capitol and the Greek Revival uh, style and the New York Customs House in New York City and the Neoclassical and Greek Revival. The most important thing to remember is mid-19th century architecture became an increasingly academic discipline. Um, you don't have your gentleman architects anymore like Gabriel Manigo, and um, people actually go to school to learn architecture. They start, like Jones and Lee, kind of morphing different types with Charleston building um, vernacular. So I'll start with some Italian. Uh, these are these slides are taken from the slides that are online, so it's okay. it's kind of repetitive. You can you can view it online if you like. But <laughs> tall, narrow windows, sometimes triple hung, uh, double windows on buildings, low pitched roofs with wide eaves, um, elaborate window hoods. You'll see, for example, on the Mills House Hotel double doors at main entrances. Usually, this is a very symmetrical building, but usually a more residential building is going to be very asymmetrical. A lot of Roman arches, interiors have mantles of slate or marble, pink marble, green marble. You kind of get that Victorian opulence kind of, I don't want to say body, but <laughs> um, it's the more the better. And you see that in Victorian landscape with the gardens. For example, the Sicily House at College of Charleston, even the fence is very whimsical. Um, let's see, this is on Broad Street, 11 Broad, E.B. White, another um, Italianate architect. He did Italianate and more classical uh, revival architecture in Charleston. And these are just a few around town. John Rutledge House around the corner, State Bank of South Carolina at the corner of Broad and East Bay. Our townhouses over on Bull Street, the only townhouses similar to what you see in New York, the brownstones up, up in New York. The two at the bottom are, of course, lost, unfortunately. The Meninger School over on St. Philip's and Buffane, and the Orphan House, which I'll talk more about um, in a little bit. In Italian and Gothic, took me the egg. I put this in here because it was kind of one didn't really come before the other in Charleston, specifically to Charleston. Um, in other towns across the United States, it's a different subject. But the first I'll focus on Jones and Lee. They got together 1852 as and formed their architecture firm and only stayed together about five years. So they had, uh, Jones did some buildings before he was mentoring Lee and they got together. They kind of played off of each other. One was better at designing, maybe not better, but one enjoyed designing um, Gothic architecture more than Italianate, and sometimes they would design buildings together. But this is just a great view of the Orphan House, which is where Barry Dorm is today. This is Calhoun Street, and this is St. Philip Street. Bandrops running across the top there. And you, you can't really see the chapel that it is on Bandrops. The thing about the Orphan House. This Orphan House kind of encased uh, the former or Orphan House that was built in 1790, between 1791 and 1793. Um, Thomas Bennett built an Orphan House that was about 30 feet wide and 72 feet, uh, I'm sorry, 30 feet deep, 72 feet wide with uh, and get my notes cheating. Um, 
housed about 115 children. The orphan house that Jones and Lee built that's kind of surrounded it. Uh, in 1850, they had they doubled the amount of children, so about 230 children. Um, Jones and Lee, of course, Gabriel Manigo um, built the. Well, it doesn't work on the screen. Built the um, chapel on Van Draw Street that went with the original orphan house. So that stayed. There was a connecting kind of um, hyphen between the two eventually. In reading, um, researching the orphan house, um, the children clogged up the churches in town. There were so many orphans, so they built their own chapel. So that's the reason why they um, had their own chapel. This is the Browning and Newman store at the corner of King here, and this is Market. So that's where the Riviera Theater is today. You would walk in, there's a great picture, or an etching of kind of the interior, just really open kind of balconies around the interior with an atrium at the top. One Broad Street, this is the State Bank, Jones and Lee did. And you can see, uh, if you look at Roman architecture and the closet <coughs> around uh, Florence and Rome, mm -hmm. you'll see the rustication in the lower story, uh, and then the window hoods, the Roman arches here, and then a smaller, more square window in, in the top stories, which you'll see in some of the closet pictures. Probably a lot of people's favorite building in Charleston, the Farmers and Exchange Bank by Jones and Lee. Moorish arches here, those above, and even the interior has the same detail. Uh, constructed with bands of different brownstone here. You can see even the curbing in front was brownstone. A lot of architects included the, the streetscape with their building. They just wanted a complete, um, a complete building. The grill work in the doors here came from Alhambra and Spain. A very Moorish uh, design that's from Alhambra, and then this is the Farmers and Exchange Bank grill. You can see the kind of lotus flowers and all the different egg and dart. This is an interior picture with the same detail. Um, Edward C. Jones, different architect, he did more. This is the same period, 1840s. He did more classical, kind of Roman architecture. That's now Zion AME Church on Glebe Street. It was Glebe Street Presbyterian Church, built 1847. Edward C. Jones, architect. And then you have Francis D. Lee did more Gothic. So Jones, classical Roman, Gothic with Lee. Uh, this is St. Luke's now fourth, what is it, New Tabernacle Fourth Baptist Church on the corner of Charlotte and Elizabeth Streets in Missy Cragboro. Um, Edward C. Jones did Magnolia Cemetery and it even had a Gothic chapel at one point. This is a view of Carlton House in London. Just want to show the interior of you'll notice the detail of the fan vaulting in there. This was applied to the Unitarian Church when it was remodeled in the 1850s. That's, of course, after the earthquake of 1886. But you can see the same exact uh, fan vaulting in there. Um, Edward C. Jones also did the Roper Hospital on the corner of Queen and Logan Streets, which is no longer with us, actually had all of the rooms opened up onto these piazzas. So can you, if you can imagine being sick in the hospital in Charleston, having your own piazza. <laughs> uh, but the, the most identifiable thing with this is the Italianate, the towers, the Italianate towers and villas on the countryside, in the countryside of Italy, a lot of towers 
their more residential uh, uses of the towers were stair halls in Charleston. It would, a classic example is 8 Woodbury Street, um, which is on our overview tour. But it has a stair hall tower. Um, I don't have a picture of it on this slide, but that it's probably the most photographed door in Charleston at 8 Woodbury Street if you walk by there. Um, but the Roman arches, the bracketed, the bracketed uh, cornice, and the towers, and the hospital. Another Italian building, this is the original Mills House. Um, Hammer's Gold did this. He later went to Columbia to design the State House in Columbia, South Carolina. This is obviously after the fire of 1861. Around the corner on Broad Street, Hammerskull applied Italian detail to the John Rutledge House, which is now the John Rutledge House Inn. This was built in 1762 and then updated to the Italian age style in 1852, I believe. Um, so the colonial house probably would have only been two and a half stories on a raised basement, so they probably added that third third story with the window hoods and the heavy, heavy cornice and the corning on the sides on each corner of the building. Um, Patrick Keeley did the St. Finbar Church, which is a, was a shell in 1861. The fire of 1861 swept through and got this building. Another example of kind of high style gothic which um, the Huguenot church also influenced by Pugin who was an English architect um, and I, I'm going to go ahead and talk about well I'll wait um, Pugin, if you're not familiar with Pugin he did very high style uh, gothic architecture extreme gothic arches, pinnacles the classic pointed arch just applied anywhere he could, and kind of, it just classic, classic um, Gothic architecture, and the Huguenot Church, which has been beautifully restored recently. He also designed, um, uh, I'm sorry, Lee designed the fence that goes around the Huguenot Church. <laughs> um, this is where we kind of get into the Carpenter Gothic style. Um, A.J. Downing, he was an architect in the 1840s and 50s, published a pattern book of kind of country gothic cottages, and we sell it in our book and gift shop. It has great smaller scale cottages for the countryside, but these cottages in, in the 1840s and 1850s he designed with kitchens already attached and closets and new, newer, newer things that are coming in into style. That was in what year? 1840s. 18, I think 1840s and 50s, he publishes several books. <coughs> yeah. Drawings like this with the floor plan, and they even include a kitchen, and, and it's just interesting, already an attached kitchen in the 1840s. This house is on our tour at 67 Rutledge. You can see the Moorish influence from this pattern book to this house, and it's believed that this house was designed by, um, by Jones. You can see the double bracketed cornice up here, the double brackets above each window usually, and it's a very square house. This house also has a roof monitor, which people sometimes refer to as a cupola. It, the cupolas on Italian houses are more square rather than round. Um, you can see this, you can see the roof monitor on this house if you go to the cupola at the Whitworth Mansion. You can look <laughs> kind of across the block there um, and see that. Um, but this lattice work, the turned columns, the detail in the, even the chimney there is very Italian. Um, and people have asked all the time, why are the chimneys in Charleston covered with these gothic kind of roof, co I mean, chimney covers, basically. And Gene Waddell, in his book, Charleston Architecture, refers to this 
this time period, from this time of Gothic, eclectic, romantic movement to adorn your chimney with a Gothic arch. Uh, so that is going to be my answer. <laughs> um, to fancy it up. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, but you see that all over town, and sometimes you see the, the Victorian, the later Victorian terracotta ones. So I'm assuming after the earthquake, a lot of the terracotta uh, chimney caps were, were put on. Edward C. Jones designs 26 South Battery, which is this house. Everybody is probably familiar with that house. But you can see the asymmetry in that house a lot. The bay windows, the arched windows, the arch piazzas, heavy heavy cornices, double brackets, um, the balustrade, the low pitch roof. It's just a classic Italian style. Um, and some of the more simple, modest homes that we will see today and that are on our tour have a few of these elements applied to them because, you know, they want it to be fashionable too. So. Um, Meminger School the girls' high school and normal school by Edward C. Jones is a great example, sadly lost. Um, this school has a had a huge cupola at the top. You see the arches here on a raised basement. The school that they put up recently uh, is, is um, tried to put the same footprint, more of a square building, where that building stood, and put kind of a roof element, I'll just say, on the top um, to harken back to this higher style italian um, building. And going back to the orphan house, this is the original site of the orphan house of 1792. You'll see here St. Philip Street, the orphan house here, and they had a huge garden in the back that they planted with vegetables to feed the kids. Um, the chapel had not yet been built, and there was a small alleyway that ran behind uh, what would become St. Matthew's Lutheran Church in the orphan house here. And this is a plan of the orphan house after the remodel with the chapel and several ancillary outbuildings. They had a small gatehouse here in the front at Calhoun Street. And here's where you really see the Italian detail with the raised basement, three stories, and then your attic or garret story. They added a belfry on the top of, of the orphan house to act as a, a city um, alarm. There was a bell up there, and it was almost as high as about 20 feet shorter than St. Michael's belfry. So you have that at the northern end of town. This is, at the time, just outside of town because Bunbury Street, or Calhoun Street, was the city line. So they would look for fires, riots, anything, hurricanes, tornadoes. Um, this is Plaza Farnese in um, Rome. I think yeah, this is in Rome. You can see, if you go back and forth between these two, you kind of see a similar detail where the Italianate style comes from. They're coming from, with this heavy coining, a delineation of each story, and a lot, very heavily decorated cornice, and you don't really see the roof. It's a very flat, low-pitched roof. And this is Palazzo Medici in Florence, kind of the same, similar situation going on there. Um, this is where I'll talk about the Gothic influence in churches mainly. Um, in New York, a visitor in 1850 kind of noticed a shift between the more Protestant churches and the Catholic church, their building types, how they were designed. Uh, buildings, and I don't didn't enjoy it when my professor read to me from a book, but it just, like I said, it, it makes a lot more sense. Um, after arriving in 1850, the Englishmen surveyed the town steeples and declared 
the local churches to be large, comfortable, well-filled, and usually ministered to by clergymen of very considerable talent. But beneath the prosperity churned, he noted, a manifest rivalry in the building and ornamenting of their churches. So he's talking about the, this is Unitarian Church before, Unitarian Church after. More colonial, he's not talking specifically about this church, but more colonial, the coining, this is obviously very Gothic. Um, Um, a manifest rivalry in the building and ornamenting of their churches. The Presbyterians, Methodists, and Congregationalists equal the the Episcopalians in their attention to organs, choirs, the engagement of professed singers, to towers, steeples, and sonorous bells, um, and other new artistic attractions. But, continued the Englishman, the Romanists are outdoing them all. And probably... enticing all the other sects uh, by the <clears throat> magnificent cathedral they are creating on the higher part of the city. Additionally, locals complained of the Catholic art of squeezing out of their humblest followers a liberal quota towards the good work. The visitors' comments illustrate that Protestant innovations were not the result of abstract outpourings of wealth. Instead, the local Romanists uh, were challenging the other churches with a specific architectural program. And for some Protestants, the changes would begin with a single bare symbol. So, at the time, it was popular, basically, to make your church. They saw that the Catholics were being successful, bringing in more people, bringing in more money. So they wanted to, the Protestants kind of wanted to model their churches make them as beautiful as the Catholic churches. That was in New York. It trickled down to Charleston, obviously. Um, During the same time period, 1850s, uh, Lee redoes the Unitarian Church, taking it. You can see the similar form, the building uh, footprint with the tower here, and then just applied with Gothic ornament in the 1850s. And then sadly, 1886... Um, this is before 1886. We have the earthquake, and a lot of that ornament is lost. Uh, the pinnacles at the top of the tower, this this window here. About the only thing that remains is above the the door at the top of one of the pointed arches. There's a small gargoyle uh, there. So that happens with Grace Church was built. Um, we did the Huguenot Church. Episcopal, French Huguenot, um, Unitarian. The it's interesting to look at the more classical revival building next door at St. John's Lutheran. Um, again, going back to Keeley, doing St. Fin- Finbar, and just now been rebuilt as St. John the Baptist. And then more Gothic, kind of industrial Gothic was applied to buildings. This is the Marine Hospital, which will be on our tour on Franklin Street. Um, there, there's not much Gothic ornament on the interior. Now it's the Clemson Architecture School. This is the German Artillery Hall, which was on Wentworth Street between King and Meeting. And the fence here is the fence that is in front of the Gibbs Museum today. This is the interior of the hall. And small things on commercial buildings, like just down the street, the Ensign building, these uh, clusters of columns that's very Gothic in design with kind of more Tudor-style Gothic arch there. And that building pretty much looks the exact same today. (laughs) It's where Berlance is down the street. The interior of, of the Houses of Parliament uh, were taken and recreated basically with Lee, uh, Francis D. Lee and St. Luke's Church over at the corner of uh, Elizabeth and Charlotte Streets in the Zeke Borough. If anyone has never been in that church, it has great, fabulous 
Gothic vaulting, but the pattern with that was taken basically from the Houses of Parliament. Another interior shot. And that's um, a picture I took of the Unitarian Church vaulting. Uh, Liam, <laughs> um, now I'll just speak a little bit about Harleston Village, and then we can grab some water and get get going on our walk. Harleston Village was laid out in 1770, and it includes an earlier parcel of land in the Zeke lands from 1742. You can see here, but today the village of Harleston, the Harleston Village neighborhood, consists of the Mazik lands, the Glebe lands, the Free School lands and what was rag, rag pasture there was um, the cow pasture which is between St. Philip and King Street excuse me can you pronounce the name for A one more time Mazik Mazik okay. uh, the Mazik lands were roughly bound by Broad Legree, Queen, Archdale, Buffane and Smith those lands were basically where they built the the city jail, river, um, the marine hospital, and the city work, workhouse. That block is, is within the Mazik lands. It was con conveyed in 1712 and partitioned as early as 1742. Um, these, on the bird's eye view, we are here on the Mazik lands, roughly south of Buffane and west of. Um, Archdale Street. And the jail and workhouse complex, the octagonal portion was designed by Robert Mills, but it also had that more industrial kind of Roman Gothic application of the, the crenellation at the top, and of course River Hospital with its towers. The Harleston lands were laid out in 1770 as the second suburb of Charleston next to Ansonboro. Ansonboro being the first suburb of the city of Charleston. It developed slowly and by 1819 it was still indented with marshes and creeks. This is basically the Ashley River, Harleston Village. This is from the Halsey map. All these little creeks and marshes were still there. The larger homes that we'll see in Harleston Village were built on the higher pieces of land in Harleston Village. And the village had a golf course. Um, I don't think I have it in the slide, but by the 1790s, the first golf game basically was played in America in Harleston Village around the intersection of Bull and Rutledge Avenues. It didn't, it didn't have a number of holes the way they played it then. It was a little different. Um, there is a book that goes into detail about how it might have been played. But there is a, an account of a number of golf balls and golf clubs being shipped from Scotland to Charleston in the late 1700s. So the game was being played in Charleston somewhere. <laughs> uh, the names, of course, these are these slides are taken from, from the slides on our website, so you can refer to those, uh, but very familiar names to us today. <coughs> About the only name changed, Lynch Street changed to Ashley Avenue. Like I said, the largest homes we call suburban villas were built in Harleston Village on the higher pieces of land. The William Blacklock House, now owned by the College of Charleston, is a federal-style house, as well as the Gilliard Bennett House at 60 Montague. The Thomas Bennett House, Governor Thomas Bennett House, is going to be on our garden tour, 69 Berry Street, another example. And then later, 1850s, this is an Italianate, more Italianate suburban villa, the Jenkins Michael House at 94 Rutledge Avenue. Uh, the Glebe lands, again, this is a slide taken from our online class. Uh, a Glebe is land belonging to a parish church. Six Glebe Street, there on the right, is now the president's house. That was built as the bishop's house for, for the, um, 
for St. Philip's, the St. Philip's Parsonage, 1770. The basement of that house is where the College of Charleston started. They took classes in the basement there, bought land, the free school lands were donated, and then they later built Randolph Hall in 1820. Uh, this small portion of the lambs. You can see St. Philip, Glebe Street, this is Wentworth, and George Street. Randolph Hall here, and 6th Glebe right there. The free school lands, as you can see, the um, previous to the College of Charleston building Randolph Hall, it was uh, a, a barracks for soldiers fighting in the French and Indian War.